All right, this is Steve Barker uh, with uh, MIC Systems. Software we're going to be looking at today is called Commander. And Commander is a software product uh, that we've developed over the past number of years. We are a software company based in Southern California. And we've been in business for 38 years. Our offices are located right between Los Angeles and uh, San Diego. So right next to the John Wayne Airport, all our software development is done here, all of our programming is done here, all of our technical support is done here in California. We have approximately 3,000 installations now in 10 different countries. Uh, this video is being recorded on April 12, 2017. Lee, good to have you in the meeting. And uh, if you'd go ahead and just tell me a little bit about your business, a little bit about what you guys are looking for and what has you out looking for software, and then we'll just kind of roll with the demo and get this started for you. All right, sounds great, Steve. Uh, we are Motorsource Colorado. We are a small independent uh, motorcycle and power sports shop in uh, the mountains of Colorado, Eagle, Colorado to be specific. Um, our business is mostly uh, going to be repair, um, accessories, um, and hard parts. Um, we're basically looking for a system that can speed up our uh, parts sourcing, you know, looking up parts, um, ordering, um, receiving, all that, uh, that stuff entails, um, as well as a, a little bit quicker point of sale um, than we currently have. What are you guys currently using? Uh, we are currently using Square. Oh, okay. I know. I know about Square. So we, there's a uh, lot of we. We made a, the mistake of going with Square, trying to save a little on budget, um, you know, as we grow. But we ended up being a little busier than we expected. Um, and it's yeah, Travis said it took him. Travis said it took him all of about three days to figure out Square wasn't going to work for him when I spoke with him yesterday. So, yeah, exactly. It, it was more about three hours. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's yeah. what I said. It was about three days too long. So you had it figured out a lot quicker than that. Okay, so let's do this for you. We're going to walk you through a little presentation here. I've got a PowerPoint that I go through to just help me keep on script a little bit, mostly so that it helps me not forget things that I'm supposed to tell you. Sure. Um, and then we'll go in and out of a live view of the software. Who, who are your primary suppliers? Are you guys dealing with Tucker or Parts Unlimited, WPS, any of those guys? Or who do you do business with mostly? We are a WPS dealer, and uh, we will, or we are actually a uh, Parts Unlimited dealer now as well. So those okay. will be our two big ones. And then I think Travis said you guys are servicing a lot of KTM units. We are. Uh, KTM is very popular around here. Um, it's just the, the go-to. Almost everybody around here rides uh, off-road stuff, and they're obviously kind of got that market, market cornered. And you guys are working on other metric units. Do you do any, any work on Harleys at all? You know, we were trying to do maybe some oil changes and tires and things like that, uh, but not too much extensive uh, no, no engine work, work on Harleys. No, okay. probably not. All right, so that's perfect. Let's let's get rolling here, and I'll just power through this for you, and we'll get this this demo kind of on track. We looked at our location here. One of the key features of Commander is the fact that we have price file support for probably around 600 different distributors and vendors, and they're spread between Power Sports, Marine, something we call OPE, which is outdoor power equipment, which is kind of the lawn and garden sector sure. and then some golf cart dealers believe it or not have also found us and it's become a pretty good product for that market too yeah, so what you go on the list there yeah easy go and we've got club car Navel, red hawk uh, a bunch of others so when we're looking at this list of prices uh, price books that are available you guys can actually pick the ones that you want and on your price quote there'll be a, a page uh, it'll be the second page of your price quote, and you'll have a spot where you can go in and pick the price books that you want. So obviously, WPS will be one of them. Uh, Parts Unlimited will be one of them. That also includes the drag the drag line, uh, drag specialties, and then, of course, KTM. And any of the, the other lines that you need that you do service work on, 
um, you can basically give us a list of the files that you'd like to have loaded into Commander. And those are going to populate the database uh, before we start. Commander is running on a Windows platform, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But the database, which is a SQL database, currently SQL 2016, uh, will populate with these different price books, and they're really nicely formatted. They're kind of in a folder listing like this. So very similar to what you'd be used to seeing on a Windows computer. But what this does is it kind of combines uh, Microsoft Outlook with kind of a Windows folder design, and then it pops into kind of an Excel spreadsheet kind of look. So if you were to click on KTM just as an example, that's one of the many files that I have loaded here, you'd get a list of all the KTM part numbers, descriptions, and pricing already preloaded into the database. Now, if you compare that with Square that you guys have been using, or QuickBooks, or any other system, you've got to manually input all those parts into the database uh, that you stock all the price points, cost and retail price, and then whenever there's a change, you have to manually change it. So we've designed a system that basically automates this whole pricing thing. Um, I can go to Parts Unlimited, for example, click on this folder, and that's going to have every single part number that Parts Unlimited sells in a folder here, too. Same thing as if I was to go to WPS or any of these other suppliers. And I've got so many price books loaded in here because I'm always demoing different people and I like to just use one data set. But I've probably got, you know, three, four million part numbers populated in this database. I've got a huge data set here. So so SQL in, in, in Windows, the database engine that we're using is designed to handle massive amounts of data and it does it really, really easily. So on this Parts Unlimited one that we're looking at here, there's a part number, for example, and a UPC code, which means that we can use a barcode scanner. When we're putting it into inventory, we could actually pick up this helmet if we were popping it in for the first time, scan it. The system's going to know about it, pop up with the item like this, and then we can tell it, okay, we've got two in stock, for example, hit the save button. And that's how we put it into inventory for the first time. Okay. Yeah, as far as our selling price goes, you're going to see they have a cost price. This is what you pay for it. In the mm -hmm. case of Parts Unlimited, you could be a platinum dealer, and we've got platinum file for you. We've even got a way to update your dealer pick pricing. So if you guys have specific brands that you get dealer picks on, we're able to update those. And I'm going to show you how we update both the warehouse counts, uh, dealer deal a pick pricing and price books here in just a second. So you'll see in the system, you get your cost price, you get your list price. This is what they suggest you sell it for. And then there's a sell price here. And the sell price is basically what you sell it for. Now that could be the same as their retail price, or you might decide that you want to discount it or you want to bump it, you know, whatever sure. your area allows. Um, yeah, and the program's got the ability to put formulas into it where you can actually calculate it and customize your selling price. Okay. All right. The other thing you can do from here is you can right click and print a barcode label. Uh, Commander is fully integrated with barcoding. Now, no Parts Unlimited provides barcode labels when they ship out product. Now, a lot of the stuff also that they uh, send out already has a barcode on it. So if it already has a barcode on it, the price book that we get from them will have a UPC code and you won't have to print your own label. You can just scan the existing label that's on the product. So we integrate, uh, obviously, as a Windows network, we're not running on the cloud. Uh, you can run one or multiple computers. And I, we only need a full-blown Windows server if you're going over 10 workstations. Anything under that, we're simply going to take a Windows 10, 8, or 7 machine. We prefer 64-bit. And of course, the newer the computers, the better. Um, they don't have to be running the same operating system. You can mix and match. You could have computers running Windows 7, 8, or 10. Um, Windows 10 is probably a preferred platform at this particular stage. And then we just Windows network Windows 10 them. is preferred? It's preferred, but, but, but okay. again, like That's I said, what we have. Yeah, Windows 8 or 7 is all fine. So here's a barcode scanner. The scanner that we're actually currently selling is a Honeywell 1902. So if we go looking for Honeywell 1902, let's just do that real quickly here. It's worth, it's worth talking about. Actually, let's get images of them.
this is a pretty neat scanner. It's a high-end scanner, so you can kind of see the pricing on these different vendors that are selling it. Barcode Giant has it for 689. POS Guys is selling it for just over a grand. Um, this is the one that we have here, this Honeywell 1902 here. We have some of these that are refurbs uh, for about $295, and then we also have some brand new ones that we're selling for 375 or 395. So we've got we've got a good good price point on these scanners. So if you don't have a scanner, um, we recommend getting one. And then of course we'll be able to integrate and, and scan the labels that come on the product from you know Parts Unlimited or KTM or whoever. You'll be able to simply pick up the items, scan them when you're putting them into inventory, and then hit save and you're done. And of course that's your count that you're putting in. Sure. And uh, so we do actually already have a scanner. Um, it's just a basic USB corded scanner. Um, do you know if that would work? It's a symbol brand. Yeah, it, it it will work. So typically, when people ask the question about their their scanners, if they have a scanner, um, a scanner is really just an input device. So it's very similar sure. to just typing it in on a keyboard. Yeah. So it's it's a similar kind of a question as long as it's a you know USB scanner. Um, Typically, all the scanners that people have will work with Commander, and there's no special coding. Great. So here, yeah. So here we're showing a label printer, and the barcode labels that Commander prints. If you do choose to print your own labels, require purchasing one of these two printers that I'm showing here. Um, there's also a new printer. We have a model for the new one. These are both refurbs, but it's a little cheaper typically to just buy the refurbished printers. Um, you sure. can find these on eBay or you can get them from us. Uh, the Zebra LP2844 specifically, not the 2844Z. Uh, and the, the one that we currently stock right now is the Zebra ZP450. But these labels that you see on the side here, and I'm going to go ahead and blow them up a little bit on the screen so you can get a better look at them. You can see that it would print the part number, it would print your store name down here or the name of your store. Uh, you can optionally put the price on there. That's not required. So some, some people like to use them as pricing labels and put a price on them. But then, of course, when the price changes, you have to relabel them. Mm -hmm. So we can turn the price off. But this is just a way for you to label parts that don't already have a label on them. All right, let's move to point of sale because you mentioned you were using Square for point of sale and then I'm going to show you how we sell a part in Commander. Now, the type of receipt that you get just depends on the type of receipt printer that you have. So basically, if you have a small footprint star printer or a thermal printer, you're going to get a thermal receipt, kind of like a grocery store or credit card receipt. Yeah, we, we have a TSP-100. So this will work great. Um, TSP-143 Eco is a pretty common model, too. Um, these, of course, hook together with a cash drawer. So if, do you guys have the cash drawer with it? Yes, we do. So that's going to work for you guys. You won't have to buy a printer or a cash drawer, but those are options for people that don't have these already. Okay. And, of course, if you're using that type of printer, the drawer will pop open when you're collecting cash or check or whatever. Okay. Uh, let, let's let's go ahead and sell a part, and I'll show you what that looks like in Commander. Now, we've got a couple of these helmets in stock. So what we're going to do here is we see we've got two in stock, and we're going to go ahead and take the UPC code here, and I'm just going to copy it over to an invoice to give you an idea of how quickly you can sell something in Commander. So I go into Commander. I open it up. I don't have to collect the customer's name. I scan the item. It goes right onto the invoice. I go to the checkout window and I hit invoice. At that point, the customer tenders 323, assuming it's cash, and I'm just going to do it really quickly as if this was a quick cash sale. So without a whole lot of data entry or keystrokes or whatever, you're just scanning it, and you're printing an invoice, and you're done. Okay. We can do it in about six seconds, six to seven yeah, seconds, great. and you're done. Super fast, not a lot of touching the keyboard. In this case, I didn't collect the customer's name, and you'll also mm -hmm. see that you have your logo printing at the top here. So we've got a uh, an image loader, Lee, where you can load your logo in for your store, and then it'll print that at the top of the form. So this would be if we was if we were using a laser printer, and remember the other one we were looking at would be if you were using a thermal printer. 
But either way, both styles of invoices are already pre-programmed in the in the software itself. And in Commander, you can choose a number of different form templates which are already coded. So if you don't like okay. the design the design of that form, we've got other form designs that different dealers have asked us to do over time. Sure. All right, so we sold one. Let's go back and sell another one. Close this one out. So that one was just a counter sale customer as if we were in a hurry. Let's sell it to a specific customer now. Uh, we go, we open up the invoice and we've got a button here for adding a customer for the first time. So here we can put his name and address and so forth in here and build our customer database. Mm -hmm. um, we can also extract, typically, if you have a customer database in Square, I don't know, did you, did you collect customers' names or not? We have been, um, but very, we don't have a whole lot. We've only been open for about six days now. So. Oh, you guys are brand new. We are brand oh, new. Okay. So for dealers that have customer databases in other systems, uh, coming off QuickBooks or coming off other DMS systems, we can extract the customer list and import it into Commander. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the demo just to cover that point. But in that case, then your customer list would already be here and you would simply pick a customer, look him up by his first name, last name, phone number, a variety of different methods, put the customer on the invoice. And then of course, same process, you could type in or scan in the part number, go to the checkout window. Now we can ask the guy how he's paying. These are our payment methods on the left, cash, check, debit card, credit card. Might be paying, let's say, with a credit card. We could pay it that way. Uh, if he was paying cash, let's say he was tendering $400 and we add that payment, it's gonna make change for you down here at the bottom. And then of course we can go ahead and print the invoice. So it, it serves as a full point of sale system to collect any sort of payment method. Uh, if you tender multiple payment methods, maybe the guy wants to give you $100 cash, put the rest on his credit card, you can do that. Great. Now you can see we've actually sold it to a specific customer. You can see his name on the top left of the form there. And uh, we've printed our invoice that way. So we've sold both our helmets. We don't have any left. Uh, we sold the two that we had. Now let's say we come in to sell it again and somebody wants that helmet and we type in the part number for that particular helmet whether we can't really scan it at that point but this is what you're going to get this item is not in stock do you want a special order it and you could say yes or no you would say yes if you didn't have it and you'd say no if you did have it obviously in that case your inventory would be wrong the system saying you don't have it but you happen to know that there's one in the back room and it just wasn't entered or whatever so we're going to go ahead and order it at that point, it puts it on a special order section of the invoice down at the bottom. And of course, we would go ahead and select our customer's name that we were going to sell this to. Go to the checkout window. Now we need a special order deposit. In this particular case, our deposit percentage is set to 100%. That's going to be my store policy. And if I know this guy real well, I could zero out the deposit. He could just pay me on pickup. If I want to take 50%, I could put in 50%. Let's have him give me half the money now and half on pickup. So you can do a variety of different things with that deposit prompt. I'm going to leave my store policy at 100%. Tell this guy he needs to give me 32320, and I'll go ahead and order him his helmet. Let's say he wants to put that on a credit card. He's going to put that on his visa, and we're going to go ahead and print his deposit ticket for him. So in that case, you'll see down at the bottom, it says deposit amount 32320. And this is actually a special order ticket. This item is actually then sent to an ordering pad so we don't forget to order it. So this is where it gets kind of fun. And we're gonna leave Square behind a little bit at this point, Lee, if we haven't already. <laughs> we'll go to our ordering pad here. It's called the PO pad, purchase order pad. And that helmet is sitting right there. It shows us that we've got to order it it actually also gives us the customer's name. So you'll see the customer's name here. Are you with me? Yep. And you can see the invoice number, 1655. So it's letting you know who you need to order it for. And we'll come back to the ordering pad at the end of the day because everything that we need to order 
is going to be collecting to our ordering pad. All right, I'm going to go back for just a second, and I'm going to show you two apps on the desktop that I want you to see before we go any further in the demo. So this is my desktop. As you can see, I'm running Windows 10. The first app I'm going to show you here is a price file loader. It's this yellow, green, and blue book here. I'm going to click on this, and this is how we deliver the price updates to you. So when there's a new KTM file or there's a new WPS file, you'll get an email from us that says, hey, Lee, there's a new WPS file. Don't forget to load it. Say I want to load a Kawasaki file today. I would click in here, um, click on Kawasaki just as an example. And then this check for update button here at the top here will ping our server in California, grab the new file, bring it to your computer, load it, and update all your pricing electronically. It does it all for you. So you don't need to be an IT guy or a programmer or whatever to know how to load price files. We format them. We get the data prepared for you. We host it on a server. And all you have to do is, is load the update. So that's how we'll deliver all the price files to you. Nice and easy. Okay. This next one's really fun. You'll like this guy. This guy's a warehouse locator. This is another app that we've written. And this app is designed to do two things. In the case of Parts Unlimited, it's going to get their warehouse counts. So all the stock that they have on their shelves at their various warehouses around the country is going to port into Commander. You also have a spot here where you can put in your dealer number. Uh -huh. Now, when you enter your dealer number here, you can actually update your prices. And this is the thing that gets your dealer pick pricing. Parts Unlimited is hosting a file for our dealers. So basically, they have the file, and they know the pricing that you get, those additional dealer pick brands that you get deeper discounts on, that's in a file that they host on their server. And this app basically pings their server every night at whatever time you set up. It can be in the morning. There's a time here. And you go ahead and you set it up to run at a specific time. And every day, it'll just go out, ping their server, download their warehouse counts into Commander, and also update your pricing for Parts Unlimited with dealer pick pricing. That's a huge deal because you're not only getting your platinum pricing porting in, but you're also getting your dealer pick pricing. Okay. That's a big deal because that can change overnight. Right. You know, one, one distributor suddenly starts a special on Dunlop tires and everybody follows suit. It's kind of like the airlines, they, you know, when they have their price sure. wars. Right, and we would have to otherwise uh, go in and find all those, update them manually. Yep, I, I'm with you. Exactly, you'd have to do it manually, and that would be a pain because they would be different to the to the platinum pricing. Sure. So let me come back into my items list and show you something else that's unique to Commander, and then you'll see the warehouse locator. I'm going to look for a filter here. I'm going to do a search for a KN111. And before I go ahead and hit enter to, to execute the search, let me tell you something real quick. We we discovered that Parts Unlimited, Takaraki, WPS, which also then acquired Marshall, these distributors sell a lot of the same product. Bell Industries, Land and Sea, there's a whole bunch of different companies that sell approximately 35 to 38,000 of the same items, they're distributors for the same manufacturers, KNN filters, MFM brakes, whatever. I mean, there's just a whole ton of different product lines that you can really get from any one of those distributors. So when you set up an account with WPS and you also have an account set up with Parts Unlimited, a lot of times when you're looking for a product, you have a choice between either distributor. You could get it from either place, right? Right. So. What they do to kind of confuse the issue is they change the part numbers on their products a lot of times. Let me show you what happens when I do this search. But we built a cross-reference that links them all together so you can actually see who has what at what price and where it is. This is what it looks like. I do a KN111 and I do a search for it and my system pops and it actually shows me there's five different places I can get it. I can get it from Takaraki as a 40 1450. 
I might not have an account with land and sea, but they sell it as a 501-KN111. WPS you do have an account with. They sell it as a 56-0111. Bell Industries sells it as a 5702-1110. And Parts Unlimited, in this case, didn't change the part number. It's a KN-111, but that's rare. They change the part number on items a lot. So the first thing is I the first thing I have is I have all these different suppliers nicely cross-referenced together. All I did was a search for a KN111 and it's telling me who has it and what part number I would order it under. Then over here it's going to show me if I have stock on the item. And let me just fix this one. I was actually showing someone the other day that I could sell decimal points. So we can actually sell, you know, partial quarts of oil or, you know, that kind of thing. That's why that had a 1.5. Oh, that'd be great. So if we're doing selling bulk oil for, um, say, oil changes and stuff like that, we can just do, you know, 1.5 or 1.2. Yeah, or a 0.25, and it'll keep track of the oil to the to the second decimal like that. Yeah. Oh, great. I'm just zeroing out my stock as if I didn't have it. So in all these cases, I'm saying I don't have it. And let's say I'm on the WPS one. Now, the next thing I can see is what price everybody sells it to. So by crossing up all these numbers over here, here's the cost price. Kind of see that? Yep. So I'm doing a cost comparison between those distributors to see who has it at the best price. And then down here at the bottom, you're going to see this warehouse button down here. When I click on that button, that's going to show me the stock that WPS has in their warehouses. And it shows me that they have plenty of stock in all their warehouses. So I could order it from them for sure, from the closest WPS warehouse, and they would have it. If hey, I clicked Steve, on can the we pause for just a moment. Yeah, you bet. So I clicked on Takaraki just as an example to show their warehouses, and I could do the same thing with Parts Unlimited. So the, so the idea behind this is that you type in one little part number, KN111, you can see all the suppliers you can get it from, compare their cost, and see their warehouse information all in one screen. That's a really powerful search feature. Yeah, that's great. In here, we can also set stocking levels for items. Let's just touch on that, and then we're going to go do uh, some service work. You can see here we can set a min-max on the item. So that would be if the item fell below 3, let's order back to 12. That's an example of making sure we don't run out of fast-moving parts. Yep. And any time anytime it's you know the time of day or time of week to run a stock order in Commander, you can run a stock order and generate that based on your min maxes, see what you're low on, and those items will also push to the PO pad so that you don't forget to order them. Sometimes you want to do that also to make it to a minimum in terms of a shipping minimum so you don't pay freight. If Parts Unlimited, for yep. example, has a $50 minimum and you're at $45, hey, let's, real, you know, let's check real quick, see what we're low on, and just make up the balance on stuff that we might need for stock. All right, let's zip out to the... Um, service module here real quickly and we'll do a work order for you because this is where it gets really the system becomes a lot of fun when you head to service and I think this is a large portion of what you guys are looking for in a program so down in the bottom left I'm going to click on the repair order module 
and we'll launch that. And once we hit the repair order module, you're going to see a list of all the different units that you work on. You can see customers' names, your make, model, VIN number, and so forth. And this is a grid where we can actually search for service history. So if we need to look for the service history on a unit by the VIN number, we can just type in a portion of the VIN. Let's say I was looking for the service history on this Articat Wildcat that I have, and I just type in, and just like that I get just a portion of the VIN number, I get a complete list of all the work orders that I've ever done on that unit. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I can go back to, you know, in this case, September 2015, here's a copy of the work order with everything we did on the unit, and we can look at it. The other thing we can do that's really cool is we can search inside the work order. So let's say this customer, this guy Richard came in and he said, you guys did some work on my tachometer, on my tack here, and it's gone out again. And I think this is still under warranty because it's only been a few months since you did that work. And you have no idea what work order it's on, but you know that you've done a lot of different work orders for this guy. So we, we go into a search feature here in the program and we just do a search for that item. And we're gonna search through our repair orders and just like that it comes up and tells us the repair order that we did it on and we can double down on that, click on it, and it puts us in the work order. So without ever knowing which work order it was, we can navigate in a matter of seconds by part number right into a closed work order and find that this work was actually done in September of 2015. It's no longer under warranty. Or maybe it would come up in his favor. It was only a few months ago. It's still under warranty. And there's very few systems that I've ever seen that can navigate or search through the content of closed work orders. It's a really powerful feature. All right, let's say we were going to do a brand new work order. And I'm just going to go ahead and grab a unit here. In fact, I've got a KTM unit here that I added before the demo just because I knew you guys were KTM. So here I've got a 2014 350 SX dirt bike. Um, popped it into the system here. And this is what they would look like uh, if we were putting units into the system that we had available for sale too. This is actually a place where the units that you stock go into the system. Okay. So you can put them in here. You can put in the VIN number, the year make model and so forth, the selling price. Uh, on the back screen here, you can put in what you paid for the unit. And we can even do internal repair orders. So if, for example, this trade-in unit needed some repairs done on it before you could actually sell it, you could open a work order, work on this unit, and it would add to the base cost whatever the internal RO was, and then it would increment the unit inventory value in Commander. So you knew exactly how much money you had tied up in this unit. That's great, because if we're doing any sales, they'll be you know, used or consignment, so. Yeah, it's usually, it's usually bikes you've got to do a little bit of work on. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take this bike and um, we could sell it to somebody, but instead of going through the invoicing module and selling it, I'm just going to assign it to a customer so that a customer actually owns this unit. And let's assign it to this guy, Bradley Jones, as if he had bought it from us or that, you know, it was his bike. So do you see how I assigned it? I reassigned it from stock to customer unit. There's yep. Bradley Jones. So let's say Bradley Jones walks into my service department and he's got his bike with him and he wants to get this thing serviced. We're gonna open a brand new work order, right click, go new. We're gonna do a search for Mr. Jones. So we'll type in Jones here. There's our Bradley, we'll select him. And we'll come across to where it says customer's unit here to see what bikes he owns. There's the KTM. He's also got a ski -Doo, he's got a Honda or two, and he's got a Star, apparently he's got a golf cart we worked on. So this is a list, basically, I could do it another way. Let's show it this way. This is Bradley Jones's toy box. These ones I sold him, this one was his before I met him. But let's select the KTM for service and we'll add it to the work order. So the customer's name goes here on the left, bike information goes here on the right. 
We can view the information just the same as we did a minute ago in the unit screen, and we can also add pictures. Now, the pictures, when we're adding them for the purposes of selling the bike, that's nice. We have pictures there. But for purposes of service, it's great to be able to add pictures, double-click, add another picture, whatever. And we can add photographs of the bikes that we're working on so that we have a record of maybe damage. Maybe they come in and they crash jobs, and we want to take before and after pictures or pictures during the job for the insurance company. There's a number of reasons. Maybe there's damage to the unit and you don't want the customer to blame you. So Absolutely, you can document yep. yep, you can document all of this with pictures. That's a real popular feature. Up in the top left hand corner there's a green tab that says service request. So that's where I'm clicking next and this is where you would type in whatever the customer says they need done. So let's say he comes in for an oil change. So right here, we're still on that, that same RO. We're on the same RO. It just has a couple of different tabs. This is where I can make okay, my perfect. notes. Yeah, this is my notes for where I can just type in whatever the customer says he needs. So he wants an okay. oil change. Maybe he needs new uh, new front tire and you know whatever else he says he needs, we can type in. Now, later later on when we get into the unit itself, this case I'm just going to put in some mileage on it that can be a required field or it can be optional there's a recommendation spot down here at the bottom so when the technician checks out the bike you know maybe he only came in for an oil change and a new front tire but you find other things wrong you can type notes down here in the recommendation section and this is sort of technicians recommendations for the customer and those will print on his work order also so if he was dropping off his bike and we log it in, we put in his requested service, we could print the work order at this stage and he could sign a disclaimer if that's something that we like to do as a shop. If we like to collect a disclaimer or a signature on a disclaimer, let's go ahead and just zoom in on it for a minute. So you can see where we typed in our service requested right here. Okay. And here's where the customer would sign the disclaimer, down here at the bottom. Yeah, that's great, because we'd like to add something in there uh, for <clears throat> uh, repairs that we recommend that they either decline or um, a repair that they ask us to do that we're you know, not super jazzed about doing. Yeah, and that uh, would print to, that would print in here too in the recommendation box. So if he has okay, recommend, perfect. yeah, that would also print. And it's plenty of space. It just opens up. The forms are designed in a way that the the length of the form is not set. The more you type in those boxes, the bigger they get. Okay. This service disclaimer down at the bottom, you can customize this text. So whatever you need your service dis disclaimer to say, if there's particular legalese that your state requires or whatever you want to put in there, maybe you want to charge a fee for storage after three days of notifying the sure, guy or sure. you know, whatever those things are, you can put those in your service disclaimer. All right, let's get back to the work order here. So we logged it in. In Commander, when we first take a job in, it comes in and we just give it a status and we call it a quote, basically an estimate. We're going to work up an estimate for the guy. Uh, maybe we have to call him, get his approval. So we're going to just log it in as a quote, and that's how it'll sit right there at the top. There's our KTM sitting there. See how we logged it in? There's the job sitting at the top of the grid. Okay. Now, when we're ready to actually start doing the work on the bike, we can open up this work order, and we can start putting parts onto the work order. Now, remember, we can scan them in. We can get them in a number of different ways. There is a product that I want to show you, and if you're making notes today or taking notes today, you should write this down. There's a company that has a microfish or EPC, which stands for Electronic Parts Cataloging System, and they're called HLSM. Is that the one that they've kind of uh, they're kind of bootlegging it and have been getting out, getting away with it for a while? 
You can bootleg. Well, it wasn't really like that. It was actually designed for Mike Jackson at World of Power Sports in Decatur, Illinois. Okay, so this is a different and he's one a, and he's a French like. and he's a, yeah he's a franchise dealer for probably almost every brand except Harley Davidson. Oh, okay. So and yeah, what's so the under price Mike, on that? It's fifty bucks a month. And the beauty of it is you don't have to be a dealer to use it. Right. So that's its only advantage. Now, the other companies like PartSmart also offer EPCs. Parts Manager Pro has an EPC. And if you're a dealer for any particular line, if like if you were a Honda dealer, for example, Honda offers something called Honda IN for their dealers. Right. Articat, ha Articat has one. Uh, BRP has one, you know, through Boss Web and Articat has one and, you know, Kawasaki and so forth. So there are other ones available, but in most of those cases, you have to be a dealer to access them. So if you look at this data set from top to bottom in HLSM, you have Articat all the way down to Yamaha and everything in between, including KTM. And this gives you some pretty nice navigation because it means I can click on KTM. I can click on Dirt Bike. Tony goes back to 92 in this case, which is not very far, and there's a gap between 98 and 92. There's probably a reason for that with KTM. I'm not sure what that reason was. Do you know why? No, I don't know. Were there 97s and 96s, or did they stop making them, or didn't they have any new models for that period of time? I don't know. I don't know why there's a gap yeah, there. Yeah, it might be a new model or something, but they definitely were making bikes then. So let's go back and look at our bike. I don't know. It, you know, when I do these demos, I don't usually make it an exact science, but this is a 2014 KTM 350 that we're looking for. So let's go back to HLSM. I'm clicking all over the place here. Let's go back to 2014. It's a, there it is there, the 350 SXS. And at this point, you get the sections of the bike engine and frame on the side like this. Mm -hmm. You can click on a particular section of the bike and get to your images like this. And then down here at the bottom, you're going to get your OEM part numbers. So anything that I'm looking for or want to put on my commander work order, I can double click on the part number. And actually, this one's not even found in commander for some reason, because I have a really old KTM price file loaded. So. What I'm going sure. to do is I'm going to go back and see if this works a little bit better. I'm just going to click a different, click on a different model from a different year. So let's go back a little bit here. Because it's actually kind of fun to look at how it works when it's, uh, I didn't update my KTM file. I should have before I started the demo, but let's just go back and we'll do dirt bike. Let's go back to like 2006. I should have a price file from there. Here's a clutch cover. Okay, I don't have it dialed in. All right, so here's what will happen. When the box pops open like this, it's going to tell you a couple of things. It's going to give you the pricing on the part. It's going to give you a fitment button. Where else is this used on a KTM? So this is actually a button that you can click on to see how many other units share that part. Okay. This is a, gas a gasket that apparently there's 1,863 units that share that part within the database probably almost all of them, who knows. So that was an interesting part. That's the highest number I've seen come up with any part. But when you're parting out a bike and you're trying to, for example, sell parts on eBay or Amazon or whatever, you're selling a water pump cover and you want to know, you know, which bikes yeah, yeah. does this fit, right. there's, well, there's 48 other bikes that it fits. That's more sure, realistic. Sure. And then you can export the fitment list so that when you list that part on eBay or Amazon, you can list it with the entire fitment list. And then, of course, you're going to get a lot more hits that way than you would if you just listed it under the model that you took it off, right? Okay. All right. I'm going to bounce out of here for a second.
and I'm just going to go to a brand that I know I have set up so that we can actually see what this feature looks like when we use it in real time. So I'm going to use a Honda. I'm going to put a Honda parts on the KTM, but this will just demonstrate the feature when it's set up. So I've got our carburetor here. Here's some part numbers. Here's the images. And I'm going to double click on this gasket set. And it actually looks into Commander now to see if you have it in stock, and it would also tell you what bin it was in if you carried it. Then I can add them to a pick list. I'll say I'll need one of these, and I'm going to go down a list here and grab four or five parts. So I'm just grabbing them, even though I don't have them in stock. I'm not co copying and pasting them over. I'm just saying, yes, I need one, I need one, I need one. And it's building a little shopping cart for me, and it's doing it very quickly. As you can see, I'm just grabbing parts. Now I've got five parts. That I, want to, that I want to put onto my work order. I post those. I drop into my commander work order. I tap the import button at the top, orange arrow there. I'm kind of moving my mouse above it. And those parts drop right into my work order for me just like that. So we'd set that up to work the same way with KTM. Now we want to estimate some labor on the work order. And we can go ahead and click on a little button inside of commander. It'll bring you to a labor menu. So there's two ways to put labor on a work order. One of them is just to go to a standard labor code like this. This is my shop rate of 80 bucks an hour, and I can go ahead and add it to my work order like this. Or we can use a labor guide product, and I'm going to show you this labor guide product. And I don't know if you've seen this or not, Lee. I'll ask you, have you seen Service Manager Pro before or not? I have not. OK. So this is a product that we can click into. Looks like this. Let's close this Honeywell tab so it doesn't keep coming up. There we go. When I open up Service Manager Pro, this allows me to navigate into uh, dirt bikes, ATVs, side-by-sides. If I click on motorcycles, these are the different brands that are in here. Now, this product contains labor times and technical data for all these different brands that you see listed here. OK. So all the way from Aprilia, BMW, Ducati, Harley, Honda, Husaberg, Husqvarna, Indian, Cowie, KTM, Moto Guzzi, Polaris, Suzuki, Triumph, Victory, Yamaha, and they keep expanding this data set. You're able to actually click into the unit itself Click on the year bike that you're looking for. Diagnostic trouble codes, if they have them listed, they don't have them on this model. Um, but a lot of times they'll have, let me give you an example. Let's say Harley Davidson. We go in, we look at a Harley Road King diagnostic trouble codes. This will have all the blinks and sensors and fail codes, diagnostic trouble codes for the bike. probable causes, blinks, and sensors. And it has a ton of model information and, and uh, diagnostic trouble code information in here. We'll come back to labor times. Service specifications are things like your torque settings and fluid levels and all that kind of stuff. Let's go back to KTM and let's see if they have it on the KTM stuff, because I'm actually kind of curious now because it didn't come up with. I'm just going to mute you for a sec, Lee, because you got a little background noise. So you, I'll be able to talk, but I'll unmute you in just a second, just because we're recording this. So service specifications, this is a KTM 300XC. And you can kind of see you've got your ignition settings and your engine clutch, fuel intake, cooling system, brake system, front and rear brakes some drive specs. And so there's torque settings, wheel specs, suspension specs, front and rear. So all of that technical data is kind of loaded in there for each model. Good for the techs. Let's go to labor times here for a second. So when we click in on labor times, this is going to give you the factory time of what this job is rated at when you're doing a job like this, even when you're doing a, a quote. Let's do front suspension just as an example. We'll take something easy. Then we'll talk about the screen for a minute. 
you You're unmuted. So here we have uh, three different labor rates. I don't know if you guys have more than one labor rate in your shop, but it lets you set up up to three rates. So I've got a 55, an 80, and an $85 rate set here. So you might have a rate for dirt bikes, a different rate for street bikes or whatever, or ATVs, and so you can put in up to three. And then the time that displays, so here's a job right here that's rated in the system at 1.5 hours. Now, you can put in the settings of the program, there's settings up here at the top. In the settings, you can go in and you can put in a bump or a multiplier on flat rates. And so most of the shops that do business using this product or in fact just do business in general are putting a 50% to sometimes 100% bump on flat rate. So if the job shows at 1.5, that's rated actually one hour and we put a 50% bump in there so it displays at 1.5 hours. And then if we were an $80 shop, we'd be looking at 1.5 at $80, that would be a $120 job. So we just click on that button and that selects that labor operation code with that price and then we could go somewhere else. Let's say we go to the transmission and we pick a job here. And now we've got a couple of different labor operation codes that we've picked and to put these on the work order, we don't have to type this on there. Now we've got the jobs and the pricing and everything and we just export it out, drop into Commander, hit that import button, and just like that, we've got two labor lines that are on our work order that appear right there for us. Okay. So you can kind of see, with both of these pieces working together, we build this entire work order without typing in a single labor operation code or a single part number or anything, and it did the whole thing basically for us electronically. And when you're doing this without somebody having to explain it, you're doing it in real time, you can imagine how quickly you can build your work orders where you don't have a lot of the manual work to do that you would otherwise. All right, so at this point we could save it. We could email it to this customer if we wanted to. There's a button here to send him an email and it'll PDF it and send it to him so he gets a copy of his quote sent right to his email with this work order as a PDF attached to the email. It does it automatically in the background and we're just waiting for his approval. So we go back into Commander. We're looking at the main grid here. We've got an $839 job. We're waiting for the customer to call us or at least we call him, get his approval. And now we're ready to go ahead and start the job. We pop open the work order. And actually, before I leave the Service Manager Pro piece and move on from that, I should just mention that this is a subscription product similar to HLSM. They offer a 30-day free trial if you go to their website. And you'll notice that the pricing that we're charging, $49.95 a month, is the same price that Service Manager Pro charges. So we're not actually marking it up. We don't make any money on it. It just makes Commander work better. Okay. So you can get a 30-day free trial, decide if you like it. If it doesn't have enough going on for you, Commander still has that internal labor menu that you can utilize. And um, we think it's a great product, so there you go. All right, so back on our work order, if the customer gives us their approval, we open up the work order, and remember there were a bunch of parts that we didn't have that we needed to order. We couldn't fill them. So all we're going to do now is post the work order up here on the top left. There's a post button right above the green service request tab. As soon as we hit that, you're going to see the parts get put on special order. So if you look in the right-hand column here, I'll mark them with a yellow highlighter. You see on the right-hand side there, it says SO, SO. That means those parts need to be special ordered. All right, yeah, I see where you're talking about. And those parts are sent to the PO pad for me. So if I go to Commander and I go to the PO pad or the purchase order pad, those parts are all sitting there for me. Now it's the end of the day and I know I've got to order all these parts right here for that job I have going. I have this parts unlimited part. I've got to order the helmet for this guy earlier that we did business with today. And it's time to get my orders placed. So 
So in the case of WPS, where you have an account, and Parts Unlimited, where you have an account, it's pretty easy. You go in here, you create your purchase order. Let's do that helmet. Start a new order. We'll go ahead and add that item. Just that guy right there. We'll put it on a purchase order and create the order. So we're done. There we are. That takes care of the helmet. Got a purchase order created. Again, I didn't have to type the part number in. It's all just drag and drop real easy. We also have export functionality. There's an export button up here at the top. If you click on that export button, we can export this purchase order out into a file that uploads into Parts Unlimited's shopping cart. So if you had 15 or 20 or 30 lines in an order, you can do it just as fast as you do one item. You right. export them into, yeah, you just export them into a file. That file uploads into their shopping cart electronically. You're not transposing numbers. There's no typing. You can yep. wait five minutes before the cutoff and get your order placed. You don't have to start an hour before to make sure you don't miss the cutoff for the day. Right. In the case of you know your KTM stuff or, or OEM stuff that you need to order, let's say I needed all these Honda parts, and I get those from World of Power Sports, I would choose my vendor and create the order. So now I've got two orders that I just created, this one and this one, and they're both outstanding. They're waiting for the parts to come in. When they arrive, we open up the order. We go ahead and we receive the item. If we want to print barcode labels for the item, we can do that at this stage. And it'll also print the customer's name on the on the actual label that prints and the invoice number. Oh, that's nice. We can adjust the cost. What if you were expecting to pay 184, but you got it at 175? Right there, we can adjust the cost in the purchase order and go ahead and receive it. This feature here allows us to enter the bill. If we had a bill that we wanted to enter that came from Parts Unlimited and we wanted to enter it so it posts to QuickBooks, we could go ahead and enter it. I'm gonna go ahead and receive and skip the bill for now. And that purchase order now changed from outstanding to all received. You can see there that one says it received. Let's go ahead and receive the other order. And if we if uh, you only receive part of the order, it would still say outstanding. Yeah, let's, no, it doesn't. Let's just re let's do that on this one. We'll receive everything except that gasket set. It says partially received. That was a great question. So we got some of it, but not all of it. So it doesn't say outstanding still because that means none of none of it's come in. Partially right. received, we got some of it, but not all of it. When that final item comes in, and we go ahead and we receive that, now it says all received. Now, there's a button up at the top. If you look up to the left here, this little guy right here, this special order call list, this is a place where you go to figure out where all the parts have got to go that you just received. So you got all these parts in and they came in for different people and you know, you've got to put them on different jobs and get them ready for the technicians and whatever. So we run this real quickly, our special order call list for today. And it lets us know this is where all our stuff has to go. I received an order right before I did yours. And so there's a third customer in there. So I had this is your distribution list for repair orders. There's repair order number 116 that the parts have come in, repair order number 117 that the parts have come in on, and these helmets that the parts have come in on. Oh, that's very cool. So it makes your job easy in terms of where they've got to go. This guy we're down here at the bottom, Richard, I can pick up the phone, call him, tell him his helmet's here, or I could send him an email. Uh, these jobs, I can get started with these techs. And so let's go ahead and do repair order. Well, let's go ahead and do that helmet first. Customer comes in to pick up his helmet. We go to the checkout window. We can see he's already paid us. So we hit the invoice button that delivers it, takes it out of stock so we know that the customer came in and picked up his helmet. And this is the point when Commander posts it as a sale and posts the sales tax and so forth. Because up until then, it's just considered a special order deposit. Oh, okay. Now we are going to also have an invoice date, which is going to be the date that he picked it up. So you can see the date, the create date on the left here. This was the date he ordered it. The date on the right was the date he picked it up. 
Back in our work order for Bradley Jones here, we're going to pop that one open. We're going to give the parts to the technician so he can do the job and we can get this job started. I'm going to go ahead and remove this labor line. So we just have the two labor lines on it. All the parts are on the ticket. We've got two labor lines and six and seven. The reason I know those are labor lines, you'll see right next to the number on the left is an L that shows me those are labor lines. So I can, I can identify my labor lines very, very easily. I can also reposition them by just holding my shift key and my arrow and I can move lines around, which is really great because sometimes it's nice to group things together. So for example, let's say this labor line and these parts were all part of one job. I can right click and assign them a task or a grouping number if you wish. So that's job number one. And they're going to add together on the work order this labor line and these parts are part of job number two. And we're going to go ahead and put those on a grouping. And this is a nice feature in the program because this lets us look at jobs in a way that we otherwise can't. We'd have to take out a calculator and add all that stuff up if the guy called up and said, well, how much are you charging me to do my oil change or how much is my tire you know how much is the labor how much are the parts and you have to basically add it all together by grouping them together in tasks it'll do it for you and you can do estimates that way and you can do your final work order that way and i'll show you when i printed what it looks like the labor lines that start with an l can be assigned to technicians so the techs get credit for the hours let's put peter on the top one and let's put a different tech let's put dave on this other one let's say that one guy is better at doing you know, suspension work or the other guy does heavy engine work or whatever. So now we've got two different techs working on the same bike if we really want to. We can schedule the jobs. I need 5.6 hours from Dave. I could schedule that. And if he started the job right now, he would finish it just after five. If he's already taken lunch, let's go ahead and schedule that. We'll put him on the calendar and it sends it to a calendar for me. I'll show you what that looks like. So here we're looking at the calendar and you're going to see green and yellow. Green is the big long job that we got going here for Dave. That's the time increment that we took. And there's the shorter job that we assigned to the tech Peter. So it puts it on a calendar for us. It also gives us a list view up at the top so the techs can actually walk in. They, you know, Dave walked in and he said, what do you got me working on? He could go ahead and click on his own name or you could click on his name, it filters out everything except his jobs. And you know what, the next job up here is this Bradley Jones work order here. We've got a KTM you've got to work on here. It's at the uh, 350 SXF, double click, put him in the work order, and he can go ahead at this stage and actually clock in. So the idea behind the time clock, if the guys do use it, is we want we want to keep track of actual time. So we're not just we don't we we know it's a 5.6 hour job with the bump on it, but now we want to see how fast he really does the job. So he can clock in, clock out, clock in, clock out, go to lunch, and so forth. When he's done, it's going to write a value down here to the actual hours, and it's going to give him a value of how long he actually spent on the job so we can also measure his efficiency against billable versus actual. Right, almost like cost versus retail or list. Yeah, yeah. And it'll compute a percentage on the reports because Commander has some reports that we create. And the technician recap report that we create measures the billable and actual hours against each other for any particular technician. We'll just do year to date. And it's going to show them a summary page of the billable hours that they build versus actual hours. And my shop basically right now is running at 106.15% efficiency. It just means the techs are working slightly faster. I'm billing slightly more than what they're actually taking. Right. And there's a form there's a formula for computing that. And if you wanted to see their detail, you could take a look at every technician and where they clocked in and out and how much time they spent on each job and get a recap done with them. And that's a great thing to do because you, you, you can not only get shop efficiency, you can get individual technician efficiency. All right, so back on our work order here. Got it open twice. There we go. 
back on our work order, let's say we're done, the techs have finished the work, and we're ready to go ahead and collect payment. We're going to go to the checkout window. $750 is what I need here. And let's say, for example, the customer was paying with a credit card. Let's go ahead and take a visa, pay in full, and we'll invoice it out to see what it would look like now. The appearance of the work order actually depends on the form type that you pick. And again, we have a lot of different templates that you can use. So in this particular case, you can see the repair order number in the top right with a barcode tag there if you want to recall it using your scanner. Your logo would print at the top. And then remember, I used that tasking feature for this bike. So instead of getting one long list of parts and labor, it's grouped them together into two separate sections. So I can see the total parts and labor involved in each job and then a subtotal. The one job was 218, the other job was 502, and all together we're due 750, 66 down at the bottom. Okay, uh, one quick question here. Um, <clears throat> say we had something in, we did part of the job and they wanted to pick the bike up, use it and bring it back when we got parts for the, the second task. Is there a way to uh, partially do that or would we just be better off doing that on a separate work order? No, the posted the posted work order would allow you to collect partial payment for the work that you had completed uh, or any amount for that matter and then the work order would just stay open. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, if you wanted to post the piece that you had done for purposes of closing it out as a sale, then you could close out that section of the work order and bill the remaining piece on a separate work order. Okay. It just depends. Um, if you leave it open, then of course it, nothing posts as far as uh, sales tax totals or sales totals until you actually do close out uh, that, that portion of the work order. Okay. So pretty nice looking work order, as you can see. Um, a lot of different form templates to choose from. So I mean, I can change the appearance of this work order um, simply by going in and printing a completely different form type if I chose to do that. All of these are different work order templates that we can print. Um, we even have a form work order for the technician to use in the beginning of the job if you just wanted to give him something that showed him what he was supposed to do in a shop environment where you have your technicians just writing down the parts on labor and then bringing it back to a service writer. Oh, okay. If I wanted a different form, just as an example, I'll just print one other form, but they're all very, very different. This guy right here, as you can see, This was one that was designed for mailing, that, that hits a mailing envelope. And that's the end of the work order. So we have that job completed. And we'll have an invoice date and a status of CP over here showing us that the work was actually completed and invoiced. And that status can also be used on open work orders to designate maybe that you're still waiting for parts. So let's add this job in process. And I didn't have all the parts in yet. I could go into the labor line. Let's go ahead and just put a labor line on it. And we could designate, oh, we're, we're waiting for parts on that job. So when I'm looking at my main grid, I can manage it very, very easily because I can see here, oh, okay, that's one we're waiting for parts still. Do you have any questions at this stage about the work order section? I mean, there's a lot going on there if you think about it with HLSM and the parts porting in, Service Manager Pro and the labor times coming in. Um, the way we create a work order is actually quite unique. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty clear. Let's go back to the PowerPoint a little bit here. We talked about the receipt printer, talked about the cash drawer. Talked about creating professional looking work orders with the tasking feature here that we just showed you. 
Now, this is a feature, if you guys are planning on using QuickBooks, Commander can actually take all of the work that just happened over here on the Commander side, push it through an app that we wrote, and have it land in QuickBooks for your accounting people. Okay. And this works with the desktop versions, so not the QuickBooks Online, but QuickBooks Pro, Premier, or Enterprise, which are all desktop versions. And basically, all you have to do is pop QuickBooks open, open the interface, and hit the transfer button. And that'll take the transactions and payments, invoices, work orders, resync the customer balances and all that good stuff and take care of that. So if we look at Commander, and we did a repair order today for Bradley Jones, right? Here's the work order we did today. And if you look in the top left-hand corner, it was work order 1117 and it was for this customer Bradley Jones. If we go across to QuickBooks and we look for customer Bradley Jones, got a lot of Joneses, picked a hard one. There you go, there's Bradley Jones. Look at what landed in QuickBooks, RO1117, repair order. If it has an RO in front of it, it means it's a work order. It's repair order 117, and there's the payment that came with it. And I can actually drill down on the work order. And that transfer that we just ran just a minute ago, this little guy right here, this transfer, uh -huh. physically created this entire work order. It put the part numbers and the descriptions together in the description field like this. And it created a copy of the work order in QuickBooks for the accountants. So the beauty of that is that, you know, my parts and service guys can work all day long on the commander side and never have to be in the bookkeeping system at all. Right. The other thing we could have asked commander to do is when we received those purchase orders, remember we had those purchase orders that came in for product we ordered? We could have gone in here and entered a bill. And let's say the vendor sends us an invoice, one, two, three, four, five. Here's the date of the invoice and here's the due date. And the bill amount that we were billed depends on what we received. So. Here is it's it's actually showing me what we received, but it's also asking me what what I was billed. And so a good way to do this is to compare the purchase order. Have the purchase order lying on your left hand, the bill lying on your right hand, and ma match them up. Make sure they billed you the correct amount. But what if I didn't hit my shipping minimum and I paid an additional twenty five bucks in shipping? The actual bill that I'm looking to pay is one oh one twenty three and I can add that bill and then save it and it keeps it in commander kind of electronically stapled to the purchase order. So my bill and my purchase order are paperless at this stage. They're attached to each other. And of course, when I open my QuickBooks and run my transfer, it also takes that bill and it moves it across, puts it in the vendor payment section. So instead of entering bills in QuickBooks, I can go straight to pay bills. And then that bill is going to be sitting waiting for me right here in QuickBooks. I can go to the bill for payment and there it is. Okay. So that's a nice feature that, that ties Commander and QuickBooks together that is a nice integration piece that we've developed. And what was the uh, description of the QuickBooks that we needed, the specific program? QuickBooks Pro is typically all you need. Okay, and perfect. It's the, and it's the desktop version, and right now you'd be buying QuickBooks Pro 2017. But if somebody already had Premier or already had Enterprise, it doesn't matter. We can work with those. And actually, this interface was first developed in 2007. So anything newer than 2007, a lot of people don't update their QuickBooks every year. Even I didn't update my QuickBooks. I'm running on 2015. OK. So that'll work uh, on, on all those versions of QuickBooks. Great. Now, merchant services, this is the least favorite part of the demo, but we have to cover it. We have an integrated merchant processor that we're tied in with Global, and the client piece is called XCharge. There's a phone number down here at the bottom. So if you do decide that you want your 
commander software to have an integrated merchant processing piece, you would have to set up an account with Global. Now, if you want to keep using the existing merchant that you have, you would have to then collect the payment on what they would call a side terminal, which just means you open up a different application like the Square or some other software that you're just going to collect the money on. And sure. then you can close out the, the transaction in Commander. But a lot of people do eventually set up accounts with Global because the integrated payment processing is really nice. When you go to the checkout window of the actual work order and you, and you go to checkout and you choose credit card, there's two payment options down here at the bottom that we activate for X charge. And when you click on those, uh, there's a, w a window that pops open right in the middle of the screen, and then the, the amount's already pre-keyed. Uh, it can store the credit card information and encrypt it for the customer, so it's safely stored, not on, not on our system, but on their server. And then uh, you can recall that and reuse it if you have customers that buy product from you online. Of course, the amount's already pre-keyed for you, so you don't have to type it in, and you can just go straight to the spot where you swipe the card or they use a chip reader, which is all the EMV stuff, um, and it's all PCI compliant, which is, of course, the compliancy that we need for merchant services. The only way to ensure that you get a decent rate with any merchant company, in my opinion, is just to have a copy of your existing statement and to give them the statement and say, you have to undercut it or it's not worth me switching. And I do realize that a lot of people are under contract with their existing merchant companies, and so sometimes you've got to wait for your contract to expire before you make any kind of switch. Otherwise, it doesn't really pay you to do it. This slide right here about data conversion or data conversion, um, we charge $250 to convert people's data. That means you're coming off another system, and we need to extract your customer list, your inventory list. Uh, your make model of motorcycles or whatever and move them across into Commander. So sometimes we have a charge to do that uh, when, there's, when there's extensive data. You guys don't really have any to do, so we're going to skip over that. I just want to mention in this section, since we're recording it, is that we do not bring over any transactions. So if you're coming off a different system and you've done invoices or work orders or whatever in another system and you want to see the historical data, you're not going to be able to bring that over. Or we can't bring that over into Commander. We're going to just bring over what we call list, list data, list data. Sure. <clears throat> okay. Now we get to our pricing. And I just want to touch on this briefly because we do have set pricing for the software. It's $2,400 for one computer, uh, $2,900 for two computers. And then after that, we charge $250 per additional computer. Now, we call it users, which sometimes confuses people. But you can have 20 different user logins, and people can log in and out with their user passwords and whatever. Um, we just count physical computers. And that's, right. what needs to be, that's, that's all that needs to be licensed. OK. The current software renewal fees are $100 a month for one computer. Uh, then it goes to 120, 120 for two computers. And then after that, it just goes up $10 per month. So you would add $10 and you'd get to 130 for three, 140 for four, and so forth. And so it's just tiered based upon the number of physical computers that you have. Our renewal fee is all inclusive. It's one of the best things about Commander is that we don't charge for monthly price updates. So all of those parts price books that I was showing you in the beginning of the demo where you could choose your different price books, those are going to be included in the renewal. And okay. you might have, you know, you might have 10, you might have 15, you might have 20. Question. Technical support and training is included. So you can call our tech support department anytime you want. We've got seven days a week tech support. We even have a weekend tech that takes a cell phone home so that you can get support on a weekend. And then all of our software updates and new features are included in the renewal, meaning that when we write something new and we release new features, we are a software developer. We're always writing code. Sometimes there are features that a dealer requests and wants to see added. Um, we add those features. And of course, you don't have to pay anything additional for those. There's no minimum contract to sign because we believe if you like the software, you'll keep using it. And if you don't like it, you're going to quit anyway. So no contract is going to make you stay. 
And is there a charge for technical support? No, the technical support is part of the support bundle that the support fees cover. It's included. Is, so you can call once a day, 10 times a day. It doesn't really matter. That's included in the, the pricing that you told me before? Correct. Okay, perfect. Any additional hardware options like barcode scanners, barcode printers, cash drawers, anything that people need to purchase, those are not included in that price. You would have to buy those additionally. The software is delivered through a download, so we've got an email that we send out. As soon as we receive an order for the software, we'll send out this email basically that tells you that you can download the software and then we schedule your training. Uh, software training we have currently every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, it's probably one to two hours, that seminar, and we host that every single week. It's a live seminar with dealers that have new hires or, uh, or just new to the system or need to get updated on a particular section. You can bring questions to the webinar. Um, and, and you can get your training that way. And it's at the same time, so it's easy to remember. You'll know that we always have that session uh, every week. Once you've taken the weekly webinar, you'll be able to take one-on-one -on -one training, which is scheduled by appointment. If you needed some specific training in a particular area of the program, then we would do that with you one-on-one. -on -one. Just to kind of close out the demo, I want to touch on, a, on two quick points and then we're done. One of them, of course, is that the units that go into the system, here's a scooter, these units can actually go in as stocked units. They can be sold through the invoicing program. And associated with that actual invoicing program, when you're selling a unit, is a sales calculator up here at the top. And the sales calculator would pop open and basically do all your financial computations for you in terms of um, APR, payment, and so forth on the deal. And so this is a piece that we've written that integrates with Commander so you can see the cost of the unit, any accessories that they purchased, uh, any sort of setup fee, any DMV fees, any other dock fees. Those all populate these different fields. And that's how this deal would come together. Uh, there's a tab that'll show you the profit on the deal. So you'll be able to see on the summary tab, you'll be able to see how much money you made on the deal. And we've also added an export button now to the sales calculator that exports the information on the unit itself out into a flat file. That flat file can be captured uh, by an outside software product. Currently, we're, we're working with Dealer Track, um, and I'm talking to Fraser. Uh, these are companies, if you need somebody to actually print your forms, the sales contract, bill of sale, and DMV forms, they would do for you. Um, we do not print those. We just print a regular sort of sales bill of sale or invoice, if you wish, with the actual sale of the unit. Okay, so for the and that'd be something we'd utilize later. We're not quite to that point yet. Okay. But yeah, there's some folks that do a lot of unit sales and they want to print contracts. And so we do have a way for you to do that. It just is, it requires integrating um, just with an additional piece. But we, we, we push to that uh, product so that you don't have to re-enter the your make model VIN and buyer information. It just speeds up the process a little bit. So the final, the final piece of this is just to look at a couple of reports. And I just want to mention that obviously, even though we're integrated with QuickBooks, Commander has its own uh, general ledger. It'll break things down by GL account for you so you can see what your sales look like with any, within any sort of time period that you pick. And that's going to give you a profitability snapshot of part sales in different categories that you might want to set up or labor that you might want to track. And all of that is basically available in, in, in report format here in Commander. We can do your sales tax report for you. We can do your technician recap report for you. We can do your inventory valuation. What's the value of all this inventory that I just put into the system? So the inventory value greater than zero, that would be everything I had one or more on the shelf. We use Crystal Reports. Crystal Reports very quickly pushes things to the screen so you don't have to print them. You can export all our reports out. 
If you want to export them out into Excel or you want to export them out into PDF, every single report exports out. Of course, in this case, we can see 109 pieces on the shelf, $17,000, and that's the value of our All Island supplier. It'll do it by brand. It lists each supplier by brand and gives us valuation for it. Inventory, sales history reports, obsolescence items, what are we actually not moving on the shelves? And so you can pick the time period and then Commander will give you a list of the parts that haven't sold within that time period by supplier or maybe you're overstocked. My on-hand quantity is greater than three and I haven't sold any all year. I've got too many of these. I should consider uh, getting rid of them. So all kinds of reports available like that in the system. It's the end of the day. You want to close out your day and see how much money is in the cash drawer. You're going to go ahead and run it for just one day. I'll do it for a bigger time period. You're going to see here we handle multiple cash drawers. If your store has more than one drawer, you're going to get a payment reconciliation report for cash and check and credit card. It'll show you your credit card transactions up here and then also make up a bank deposit amount for you, assuming that you are depositing all your cash and check. But this is just kind of a uh, day end summary report so that you can see uh, the money in the drawer. And I think that kind of brings us to the end. I, th I think that that's probably all the main points that we want to cover. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions. Lee, are you still with me? Yeah, I'm still with you. Um, let me see. I had a list of questions, but honestly, I think you hit them all. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and just, yeah, I'm going to stop the recording at.